Hi. Hi. How's everybody? I'm so excited to see everybody here this morning. Yeah, I was able to do that because I knew the guy that was preaching today, so I knew he wouldn't mind cutting into his sermon time. So, but uh, yeah, we're excited that y'all are here this morning. Uh, if you perhaps don't know who I am, my name is Jared Arrington, and I'm the, the worship pastor here at Family Life. And uh, today I get the privilege of kicking off a new series entitled, entitled His Will Be Done. Uh, as we continue to wake, make our way through the book of Mark. So if you've got your Bibles, why don't you go ahead and turn to uh, Mark chapter 11. Uh, we're going to be reading in verses 12 through 26. But as you turn there, uh, something reminded me this week as I was studying for this. Uh, so a couple weeks ago, uh, a friend and, and me went uh, golfing. And I love golf. I've been a golfer for a long time. Um, and I haven't been in a while. I hadn't actually got to go play like a full 18 in probably a couple years at the big course anyway. So... Uh, so I was really excited, looking forward to going, and uh, the course we went to has, has two courses, right? Um, and one has a concession stand that's like in the middle of nowhere. It's, it's so far away from the main clubhouse. And that, of course, you know, that's where we're playing. And as we're getting out, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to the concession stand here at the clubhouse and get a snack, a drink, and everything. That way I'm set. We're good. But we were kind of anxious to get out on the course, and you know, you don't want to get stuck behind slow people, and you don't want to get caught up in the line of the concession stand. So it's like, ah, you know, whatever. We, get, we got that up there, so we can, we can wait. So we tee off the first hole. We're playing hole after hole after hole. We finally get kind of out that way. We're, and once you get past like hole four or five, you're, you're pretty much past the, the point of no return because uh, there's, there's no going back to get a snack at that point. But that fifth hole is about the first opportunity you have to go into that concession stand, right? And at that point, like I said, I was already kind of hungry and, and thirsty, so I'm like, I'm, I'm going in, I'm going. It was that halfway house after hole five was like an oasis in the desert, you know, like it's just a, a beacon. And so I walk up, I walk in the door, it's open, and they have a bay door, and that bay door is closed. Nobody is in there. And this is, you know, like 11 o'clock. Dang it, I'm so hungry, I'm so thirsty. And the only thing they have there is a soda machine. So, you know, I don't even get a fountain drink. So I, I buy a soda out of the soda machine, and I'm cranky, I'm grumpy, I'm irritated, but I, I move on. Today we see, we're going to be studying again out of Mark, and I think the, the, the most frustrating thing about that was the fact that I saw something and I expected something to be there, and when I got there, it wasn't. It gave off the appearance of something that it was not. And again, this is kind of what we're going to dive into today. So uh, this is an interesting text. It'll take us on a bit of a journey, but as a, it has an incredible truth. Uh, it'll give us insight into biblical history and prophecy, as well as give us some modern-day application. And my prayer is that we would be able to humble, humble ourselves and allow God to speak his truth and allow his will to be the compass of our life. So let's read this together. Again, we're going to be in Mark chapter 11, reading verses 12 through 26. Beginning in verse 12, it says, The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were there buying or those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those uh, selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said, said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. 
Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe it, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Will you all pray with me? Father God, we just come again before you, Lord, just, just in, in humility, with thanksgiving uh, in our hearts. and just, uh, Father, we just, we just pray that, that as we dive into this text today, God, that, that we would be able to extract truth out of it, God, that you would uh, challenge us, that you would convict us uh, of areas of our life that we uh, need to improve. But Father, ultimately, we want to be in your will. We want to live a life uh, that you designed for us, God. And Father, I just pray that you uh, bless this time, God. I just pray that you speak here today and just remove me from the equation. And God, speak to our hearts today. God, we love you and we praise you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we went from the triumphal entry of Jesus where there were a lot of, you know, hallelujahs and, and people shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, the highest, which we sang earlier. I was so disappointed I didn't schedule that song last week, but it, it happened and it worked out, so it's okay. But we go from that to Jesus cursing a fig tree and, and bringing his righteous anger into the temple. As I said earlier, uh, this text is interesting, um, so... Let's just kind of start back here at the beginning with verse 12 and, and read back through uh, verse 14. So it says, uh, the next day they were leaving Bethany, uh, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. So again, verse 3 says that Jesus saw in a distance uh, a fig tree that was in full leaf. Um, it was not the season for figs to produce that fruit, but something interesting about, about fig trees is uh, they actually, uh, the time that their leaves come is about the same time as the fruit comes. And sometimes the fruit even will produce before uh, the leaves even show up. So why is this important? Well, this is a fact that Jesus would have known. Um, so why would he decide to curse a tree uh, when, he, when he knew that it wasn't even in the right season, that it knew it wasn't going to bear fruit? And as I said a minute ago, it's because it, it gave the appearance of being something that it was not. Jesus knew that there wasn't any fruit on this tree because he's all-knowing. But he saw it as an opportunity to, to use this fruitless fig tree as an illustration to his disciples uh, of what they would see when they go into the temple in just a couple verses. But how does this translate to us today? You know, perhaps the tree represents us. So I pose this question to all of us this morning as we think about this in terms of our own life. And that is, am I bearing spiritual fruit or do I simply appear to be spiritual? Am I bearing spiritual fruit or am I, do I simply appear to be spiritual? You know, is my life a reflection and a response to what God has done? Or is it a facade? You know, spiritual fruit is a very churchy word. It's one that we throw around a lot. And you know, sometimes we're guilty of assuming that everybody knows what that is. Uh, so, if you are unfamiliar with it, it simply means that we, there is evident growth and change in our lives after we become a Christian, right? It, it, we, we see a change in us. Uh, I was thinking about, like, sometimes I, I jump on social media and watch videos. I probably do it more than I should, but I think we're, most of us are probably guilty of that. Uh, but I love reels. But one of the things that, that on occasion will pop up and then I just get in this rabbit hole of is this thing called reel or cake. Is anybody familiar with this? Come on now. Who's familiar with it? Okay. 
So what they do is they take, they take a normal everyday object and then they basically try to make that same object look exactly like uh, that, but it's cake, right? And so they'll, they'll put like, say, for instance, they'll have like two shoes and be like, which one's cake? Which one's real? I don't know. And then they'll be like, that one. And then they'll cut into it and like, nope, it's a shoe, you know? <laughs> Or they'll do like basketballs, or it's just it's just some wild things. It's incredible what people can do with uh, some flour, some sugar, some edible paint. Like it's it's crazy how creative people really are. But I just bring that up because a lot of times we see people do that, right? Like a lot of times as Christians, we put on uh, this mask, we put on. This, this suit there, hey, look at, look at us. This is what I am. I am righteous. I am holier than now. Look how awesome I am. But at the core, we're wicked. <laughs> we, we struggle just as much as anybody else, but we don't want people to see that. So again, just keep that, that, that question in the forefront of your mind. Am I bearing spiritual fruit or do I simply appear to be spiritual? So we're going to pick back up and and read verses 15 through 19. 15 says, On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those uh, selling doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And then again, when the evening came, Jesus and his disciples um, went out of the city. So this isn't the first time that Jesus has had to come into this temple and, and, and clean it out like this. Uh, it actually happened back in, in John chapter 2. Uh, and if you want like to go on your own time and go read that and, and see what he did, it's very similar uh, to what he did here. But um, it's just interesting that he, he had to come back and do it again. So I have uh, two teenage boys. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever had to walk through that in your own life, but um, probably don't. Uh, don't if you don't have to. Uh, zero out of five stars, not recommended. Um, I love my kids, I really do. But one of my biggest pet peeves just as a human is repetitive noise. So, uh, like, you know, doing stuff like that. Like, like, and, and now, let me, let me preface this by saying, I do the same thing, but I do it in spurts. So I'll do that, and then I'll stop, and I'll walk away. I'll do that, and I'll stop and walk away. My kids, guess what? This is their favorite thing to do. They just will tap, and they just won't stop. And I'll look at them, and finally I'm like, stop. And my oldest, I can't help it. Yeah, you can. Just stop. (laughs) Just stop. But what frustrates me even more than that is when I have to tell them to stop, and then I have to keep telling them to stop every couple minutes. You know, so I can, as a, as a father, I can understand Jesus' frustration here. He comes into this temple, he's like, guys, I just did this. Like, it was, it was like two or three years ago. Like, we had this same conversation. Why do you keep doing this? So, anyway, I, 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 I get where Jesus is, I guess. But, I mean, the only difference is, is uh, Jesus exercised righteous anger, and I don't think I've ever done that, but, you know... That's, that's, that's me being a flawed human, and that's okay. But Jesus was right in his anger. Uh, the religious leaders allowed this holy place that was meant to be a house of prayer for all nations to become a place of commerce. On top of dishonoring God, they allowed people that traveled from all over to come to this temple, to this festival, uh, to be taken advantage of. So one of the things that they did uh, is they would have these animals ready to sell for sacrifices, like pre-sacrifice, sacrifice. Like you can just buy it. We've taken care of everything for you. Um, 
So that was one thing that where people would come from all over to, to body sacrifices so they didn't have to travel with animals, which is probably a little lazy, but I mean, I've never had, we get in cars and we drive, I've never had to walk a, a sheep, you know, a thousand miles, so I, I'm not going to beat them up too much here. So they did that, but they, they also, you know, with people coming from all over, they had a particular currency at, in, this, in Jerusalem. And so anybody that came in with different money, guess what they had to do? They had to exchange it for the correct currency. And so they marked currency up. So basically people were coming to buy sacrifices, but they had to buy the money they had to pay extra to get the right currency, and then they're paying extra, double, triple on the animals they're buying. So they're being uh, just, they're getting taken advantage of by these folks, okay? And I think it, when I think of the Pharisees, I think of, in particular to this story, I think about, um, there's a verse in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 27, and it says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. Again, you give the appearance to be something wonderful and beautiful and holy and righteous. Yet, on the inside, you are as dead men. Much like the fig tree, uh, the temple in Jerusalem attracted many people and drew them to the appearance of being in full bloom, only to find out that it was corrupt and spiritually fruitless. You know, I believe that we can look at this temple and also compare it to ourselves. Because once we give our hearts to Christ, He saves us. And the Holy Spirit lives in us, resides in us, uh, in turn, making our souls where Jesus resides. Our life should be led in a response to the goodness of God and His will for us, leaving no room in our hearts for things of this world. Amen? But how often do we allow wicked things to creep, creep in and set up shop in our hearts? And again, this is Jesus' house. This is Jesus' house, and we're, are we allowing things to come in? So my next question that I would like to pose is, and I put I because this is a question I think we all need to ask ourselves. Am I allowing worldly things to set up shop in my heart? Am I allowing worldly things to set up shop in my heart? You know, this could be a wake-up call for you today. It could be a wake-up call for for a lot of people today. But just as Jesus drove out the wickedness, uh, drove the wickedness out of this temple, he wants to drive these things in your heart, or out of your heart and um, out of your life that are keeping you from experiencing the fullness of his love and his will for your life. Let's pick back up in, in verse 19 and we'll read through uh, at least 21 here. Again, when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out to the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from, from the roots. And Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. The tree looked good, but it didn't have any fruit. The temple looked good, but it had no spiritual fruit. You see, the fig tree was, was a parable to the disciples of what was going to occur in the temple. And then this, this, the discovery of the withered fig tree was a prophecy of what, was, of what the temple would eventually face, and that's destruction. So again, a lot of, a lot of biblical history, a lot of prophecy being fulfilled here. Um, but I want to bring it back to us today. Uh, both the fig tree and the temple could be interpreted as a picture of our lives. 
Are we being spiritual? Are we bearing spiritual fruit? Or do we have the appearance of being spiritual? We see from this story what awaits those who portray to be something that they are not. And that is ultimate judgment before God. You know, we may be able to fool others. We might even be able to, to fool ourselves. But we are not fooling God. He knows who we truly are. And this is not an attempt to make you, to make you feel like if you sin or if you don't lead a, lead a perfect life that God doesn't love you and is going to reject you. Um, you know, scarred and imperfect trees can still bear fruit. Right? Just because you aren't perfect, just because you've been through some things, doesn't mean that God can't use you. Doesn't mean that God can't show up in your life. Because that's what he does. He shows up and changes us. If you are a child of God, there will be evidence of his love and grace pouring out of you in some way. You know, this message is a, is a gut check. I know it was to me. You know, but it's a call to, for us to take spiritual, our inventory in our spiritual lives. You know, sometimes God feels distant. Sometimes it feels like God's not in our lives. It feels like he's not present. And, and I want to I share this scripture with you today, and I hope that it is an encouragement to you. And this is, comes out of John chapter 15, uh, and this is verses 4 through 8, where it says, Remain in me also as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into, the, into a fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory uh, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. We can do nothing without Jesus. We cannot bear fruit unless we are connected to the one who bears fruit in us. So, if you feel disconnected from God, I promise you it's not God that has gone anywhere. But God wants you to reestablish yourself to him. He wants to continue to bear fruit in your life. And again, just because we've messed up or we've, we've come to a point where maybe we feel like we're, we're past the point of no return, God welcomes us back in. And he will continue to do things in your life. And not only will he continue to do things in your life, if we humble ourselves and we learn from our mistakes and, the, and our shortfalls and our shortcomings, God will take those and use them for his glory. Because guess what? There are going to be people out there that are struggling with the same thing that you have struggled with. And it's this cycle of ministry. We're all ministers. We all preach the good news of Jesus Christ. So, again, if you feel disconnected, reconnect. Reconnect with Jesus. And, and a great way to, to do that is, is what? Where do, we, where do you think we start? The Word. The Word. Amen. Start reading the Word a little more. Uh, start talking to God a little more. Start fellowshipping with other believers a little more. You start doing those things and you will start to see God present in your life again. And it's, again, it's not because God separated himself from you, but it's because a lot of times we're prodigals and we want to go off and do our own thing. But he will welcome you back with open arms, okay? When we abide in Jesus, we truly begin to produce the spiritual fruit that only comes from him. I want to read the, finish out this chapter here, starting in verse 22, where it says, Have faith in God, 
Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, uh, if anyone says this uh, mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt, doubt it in their heart, but believes that uh, what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. You know, I think, I think this is Scripture, and as well here in, in John 15, that gets misinterpreted a little bit. You know, there's a lot of people that will say, all you have to do is ask and have faith. And in a lot of cases, I think that's true. I believe that that's true. But how often are our prayers, those petitions, selfish in nature? Right? So if we are outside of God's will for our lives, those things that we ask for probably aren't going to be granted because we are outside of His will. Our prayers will be shaped by our desire to live out God's will for our lives. You know, the the closer we're connected to God, the more we want of Him, the more we want uh, to be used by Him. You know, our prayers, the closer we're connected to God, they won't be self-centered or materialistic prayers. When we're connected to the Father, uh, our prayers will be gospel-driven, kingdom-minded, and God-honoring petitions. That is when the mountains that are in front of us get thrown into the sea. Because we are focused on what God desires. And our heart is in tune with the creator of this world. So again, it's not, it's not things in our lives. You know, I, I think of, of emptying myself. I said that in a prayer today, I think. God, we want to empty ourselves and and just be used by you. God, we want to be empty vessels. Use us. And when when we think that way, when we live that way, our prayers become less and less self centered and selfish, right? So I do want to address one thing, though, because I feel like a lot of people bring this up. And some people struggle with the fact that that Jesus cursed an innocent tree. (laughs) <laughs> that it's just a tree. Like, why did Jesus curse this tree? He made an example out of it. And uh, I saw this quote by, by Ken Hughes, and I thought, it was, I thought it was really good. And maybe this will help you. The reason Jesus cursed the barren fig tree was because he wanted, to be, he wanted it to become a visual parable of what was happening to Israel. In actuality, he honored that tree, making it the most useful tree that ever grew. It was and is a tree from which thousands have learned about themselves and turned back to God. If one soul has been made to consider its life through that tree, it did not wither in vain. Have you ever thought about it that way? I certainly, I certainly didn't. I mean, I understood that this was, it was an illustration that has, has brought people to Jesus. But I don't know. I think that tree's brought more people to Christ than I have. You know? <laughs> it's, an, it's an amazing, an amazing parable. And again, I just want to encourage us here this morning that, that this text is not meant to strike fear into our hearts, uh, but rather to give us hope. And that although we may struggle and we fail, uh, His grace is sufficient. His mercy and love are pouring over all of us. And I believe that God gives us stories and He uh, makes examples of others' mistakes so that we might learn from them. Allow them to speak hard but valuable truths in our lives. And this is my prayer, that God we would seek your will for our lives. Remove us from the equation. Work in and through us. May we seek God and allow him to lead us. May his will be done. Y'all pray with me.
Father God, I thank you so much for this, this story, God, and, and uh, for how it's so multi-purposed, God, that, that it, it meant something to the people of that day, God, that they could understand, that they could interpret. But God, I also thank you that it means something to us as well, God, that we can take uh, so many truths from this. And Father, I pray that each person in this room today, God, that they would humbly look at themselves and, and ask themselves if they're bearing fruit, that spiritual fruit, God, or if we are just appearing to be spiritual. God, God there's nowhere in the Bible that speaks about being looking spiritual. God, we want to be connected to you. We want to be used by you. But God, more than anything, we just want you in our lives. We want you as a part of our lives. Because God, I know that through struggle and through pain, God, that we cannot do it without you. I'm so thankful for, for the peace that you provide. But Father, we know that we can also not do good without you. For everything that we do on our own accord, outside of your, your will, without you, is nothing but a filthy rag. And Father, I just, I pray that we can just come before you in humility and thanksgiving. And God, not dwell on the past, but God, look to the future and just see how your will can change our lives. Father, we ask you to continue to move in this place, God. And we just love you, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name.